Well, all right, all right, all right. Time for an acute kidney injury. Uh, pre-renal azotemia, post-renal azotemia, whether we used to call it acute renal failure in the past, now we say, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, you slap my kidney around, I'm injured, man, you hurt my feelings. Acute kidney injury, the first thing we do is we say, okay, is that coming from a problem of perfusion pre-renal azotemia? Is this a problem with decreased perfusion, decreased blood pressure, decreased volume, decreased volume, congestive heart failure, is this a problem who's just where the kidneys themselves are normal the kidneys are normal and they're just not getting enough juice or is it a problem where oh no it's a problem of post renal renal failure with post renal renal failure it means there's a blockade there's a blockade somewhere there is benign prostatic hypertrophy or bladder cancer or cervical cancer or a stone or strict Stricture tumor or obstruction, stone or stricture tumor or obstruction, post renal renal failure blocking my urine, stone or stricture tumor or obstruction. Where does the stone have to be to disrupt it? Where does the stone? It would have to be bilateral because remember, you can't get renal failure from injury that only affects one kidney. Now this section in the book is huge, it's 15 pages. However, you can summarize it because no matter what the cause is of the pre-renal renal failure, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock is all the same thing for the kidney. I'm not getting enough perfusion. Hypovolemia from dehydration, hypovolemia from bleeding, hypovolemia from intravascular volume deficit, hypovolemia from low albumin states because you have decreased intravascular volume is all the same to the kidney. All of these feel the same, the kidney is normal. In post-renal renal failure, you have to have cancer blocking the bladder, cancer blocking the prostate. The most common cause of death in cervical cancer is post-renal renal failure. But remember, it has to block both sides. And you'll be able to tell also, because one, you can feel the bladder. You should be able to feel the bladder. Number two, you can tell on a sonogram or a CT because you have hydronephrosis, where it's obstructed. Or you can pass a catheter and you'll give birth to a beautiful two, one to two liter urinoma. We intubated the penis, intubate the penis, intubate the penis, and all of a sudden, whoosh, 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 and like, wah, 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 look at this beautiful urinoma, one liter, gave birth, wah, wah, catheter. You can feel the bladder, you can see it on the sonogram, you see the hydronephrosis, you path a catheter. All of these are one thing to the kidney. Increased hydrostatic pressure blocking glomerular filtration. Over here with pre-renal, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, a heart that beats like this. <coughs> to the kidney, it's all one thing. Decreased perfusion. Constrictive pericarditis is the same as a person who has hypovolemic shock. A person who has congestive failure and has huge edema is intravascularly volume depleted for the kidney. They're all one thing for the kidney. Renal artery stenosis with a blood pressure of 200 over 140. Renal artery stenosis is pre-renal azotemia to the kidney because it's not getting perfused. Now, if the problem is inside the kidney itself, if the problem is inside the kidney, the intrinsic renal failure, these are various forms of acute tubular necrosis. Acute tubular necrosis can be things that are various forms of toxins, like gentamicin, or like gentamicin and aminoglycosides, like cisplatin and chemotherapy, like people who have toxins like amphotericin. Which form of renal failure happens the fastest? Which form of renal failure happens the fastest? Happens in 12, 24 hours? The fastest is contrast. 
because contrast is the answer both to the fastest because it's both directly toxic and it also constricts the afferent arterial. It's like really sour candy to the afferent arterial. So you get like a kind of a pre-renal feeling. So it's ATN and the afferent arterial sees that contrast and the afferent arterial is like, oh, that contrast. <laughs> Really sour candy, so it constricts. As long as we're on that subject, what reverses toxin-induced renal failure? What will reverse it? What will reverse toxin-induced renal failure? Your gentamicin kill the kidneys, amphotericin kill the kidneys, cisplatin kill the kidneys, methotrexate sometimes kills the kidneys. Nothing reverses it. Nothing reverses any toxin-induced organ damage. What reverses adriamycin in the heart? Nothing. What reverses statins and the liver? Nothing. What reverses acetaminophen-induced liver failure? Hmm? What reverses it? I think you're saying N-acetylcysteine. Wrong. N-acetylcysteine doesn't reverse it. N-acetylcysteine prevents it. N-acetylcysteine doesn't reverse the liver toxicity of acetaminophen. N-acetylcysteine prevents it. What reverses contrast-induced renal failure? Nothing reverses it. Saline hydration, and sometimes some people give N-acetylcysteine and bicarbonate. We're not sure N-acetylcysteine and bicarbonate really work. We think that giving a little saline does, but nothing reverses it. You can only prevent it. Now, there's a bunch of things that are various forms of acute tubular necrosis. Crystal-induced damage, that's uric acid and oxalate, uric acid and oxalate, rhabdomyolysis, hemoglobin, myoglobin, hemoglobin, myoglobin. We have hepatorenal, which tends to fit in more with pre-renal, actually. It gives pre-renal numbers. Kidney, Okay, various forms of toxin like atheroemboli, various forms of toxins like allergic or acute interstitial nephritis, allergic or acute interstitial nephritis, things that are toxin there. These are various forms of toxins. The crystals are toxic. Hepatorenal is not quite toxic. Hepatorenal is more that the liver is damaged, but allergic interstitial nephritis is a kind of a toxin. Non-steroidals, non-steroidals, and non-steroidal non damage. Non-steroidal damage to the kidneys are kind of a toxin, which also includes papillary necrosis, a type of a toxin, a toxin, a toxin. So, acute tubular necrosis could be considered a group of a lot of different toxins. Crystals are toxins, and contrast is toxins, and amino glycosides are toxins, and uh, drugs you're allergic to are toxins, non-steroidals are toxic, various forms of toxins. Well, what if you are not sure which one it is? And you say, I'm not sure which one it is. Is it pre-renal renal failure? Is it a problem with perfusion in the kidneys? Or is it acute tubular necrosis? Acute tubular necrosis is often a combination of ischemia and a toxin. Because the more ischemic your kidney is, the more your kidney is starved for perfusion, the more your kidney is starved for perfusion, the more it's dry and not perfused, the more it's angry at you, the more likely it is for the toxin to kill your kidney. Well, first of all, what if you're not certain? The first thing is BUN and creatinine ratio. The BUN to creatinine ratio is 20 to 1 or more in pre-renal azotemia, but closer to 10 to 1 in acute tubular necrosis. Now, why does the blood urea nitrogen, the urea level goes up a lot more in pre-renal azotemia. Why does it do that? It does it for two reasons. Because there's low flow, it has more time for the kidney to absorb urea. Because it's low flow, the kidney absorbs the urea to try and increase the concentrating gradient to absorb more water. 
And the other reason is, did you know that there is an ADH receptor that increases urea reabsorption? It's actually called the urea transporter in the collecting duct. Antidiuretic hormone stimulates the urea transporter in the collecting duct, and you actually absorb more urea because antidiuretic hormone absorbs more water in that collecting duct. <gasps> what a beautiful system, right? What a piece of work as a man. How noble and form and infinite in faculties and form and moving. How like an angel in apprehension. How like a god. The beauty of the world. The paragon of animals. And that's how one you can tell. But what if it's not there exactly 20 to 1 or 10 to 1? It happens sometimes. You're not sure which one it is. You're not sure which one it is. So you can do the urinary sodium. Now, I personally think anybody who makes you calculate fractional excretions of sodium should be taken out and be buried in a dumpster somewhere. Because I hate calculating fractional excretion of sodium. That's what people become nephrology fellows, so they can say, you can't understand this, you need to consult me. Calculating fractional excretion of sodium. Because every time the fractional excreted is low, the urine sodium is low. And every time the urine sodium is low, the fraction excreted is low. So in pre-renal azotemia, you have hypovolemic shock, neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, dehydration, a heart that beats weak, <coughs> constrictive pericarditis makes it weak, low albumin makes decreased perfusion pressure. Whatever way it is, pre-renal is really 10 different ways of saying, hey man, my kidneys, I'm not getting them enough, I'm a dry. So what happens to your urine sodium when your kidney experiences it, it is dry? Does the kidney reabsorb more sodium or less sodium? The kidney will reabsorb more sodium. So the urine sodium is low, less than 20, less than 10. It's low. The urine sodium is low because the kidney absorbs a lot of sodium, helps it reabsorb the water. Also, that's what kidneys do. They absorb, reabsorb sodium in water. Now, in acute tubular necrosis, the urine sodium will be high. Kidney tubules absorb sodium and water. Acute tubular, you see the word N means necrosis, tends to mean it's dead. We can call it ATD, acute tubular death. If a normal live tubular cell absorbs sodium, will the dead cell absorb more or less. It'll absorb less. Dead things, write this down, write this down, okay? Dead things don't work. If the kidney tubule is dead, it can't absorb the sodium. So it goes into the urine. And the other one is the urine osmolality. The urine osmolality is a measure of how much water the kidney can absorb. Here, I'm dry, I'm dry, my body is dry, my body is dry. So the urine osmolality is very high. Remember, a normal serum osmolality is 300. Normal serum osmolality, 280 to 300. So if my, the kidney thinks I'm dry, 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 I'm gonna absorb a lot more water. I'm gonna absorb a lot more water because that's what kidney tubules do, they absorb salt and water. <gasps> the kidney tubule is dead! The way is shut. The dead keep it. And your dead tubules can't absorb water because they're dead. All right, plan B, you memorize the numbers. <laughs> but I hope you won't do it that way. I hope you won't do it that way. You know, there's no new nephrology. There's no new nephrology. There's no new nephrology. They pick up a couple of new blood pressure medications and the cardiologists say, hey, blood pressure's ours. The nephrologist says, no, I want something new. But there isn't any new nephrology. There's no any new nephrologic diseases. Ooh, I got one. We changed the names and Wagner's granulomatosis or Churg Strauss. Let's change it to allergic angiitis. Or instead of calling it C. anca, we call it antimyeloproxidase. I'm uh, sorry, antiprotonase 3, protonase 3, P. anca is antimyeloproxidase. So is that new or we just changed the names? So since there's no new nephrology, 
You want to commit yourself to saying, I'm going to learn this now and I'm always going to know it. You need it for everything. In pre-renal azotemia, the urine sodium is low because the kidney absorbs more sodium. The urinal is well as high because the kidney is absorbing more water. In acute tubular necrosis, the kidney tubule is dead and you can't absorb the sodium and you can't absorb the water. Because the kidney tubule is dead, you also can't absorb the urea. That's how you'll tell the difference. Now, acute tubular necrosis is often a combination of decreased perfusion, ischemia, and a toxin. We already said that the fastest of those toxins is contrast. Saline prevents it, but it can't reverse it once it's it can't reverse it once it's happened. Now, let's see. They give you the story about the ethylene glycol, ethylene glycol overdose, the ethylene glycol overdose, and the antifreeze. Because antifreeze and ethylene glycol is sweet. That's why people commit suicide with it, or they could, as if there wasn't so many other things to commit suicide with. But ethylene glycol, mm, it's sweet. It's sweet. It tastes sweet. And what ends up happening is ethylene glycol is metabolized to oxalic acid. And oxalic acid and oxalate binds with calcium and forms crystals that can kill the kidney tubules. There you go. Give calcium, fomepazole, calcium, dialysis. Fomepazole blocks the production of the oxalic acid. Fomepazole and alcohol. Why anybody wanted to invent fomepazole, it was the only time we could have given alcohol, is the only time in their life that you can say, my prescription for you is to get you legally drunk. Let's give you alcohol. And some spoil sport has to like, I was like, why don't you go invent the malaria cure? Why you gotta like get an rain on people's parade when they finally can legally prescribe alcohol? Fomepazole or alcohol blocks the production of the oxalic acid. Now, next one. A person has leukemia or lymphoma. Leukemia or lymphoma, or, uh, okay, leukemia or lymphoma, and they should have gotten fluids, and they should get allopurinol, and they should get one other thing before their chemotherapy. Fluids and allopurinol, and what other thing? Fluids and allopurinol, and raspberry flavored uricase. Rasp uric ace. Because allopurinol prevents the production of uric acid, prevents the production of uric acid, and rasp uric ace, rasp uric acid ace, rasp uric ace breaks down the uric acid. And if you don't do that, then you get renal failure from uric acid, the crystals. Kidneys don't like that. Also, the other thing here, remember that these are envelope-shaped crystals, oxalate crystals. Oxalate crystals are envelope-shaped crystals because they look like an envelope, yeah. Now, once the renal failure occurs, we don't have anything to reverse it. Fomepazole and alcohol prevent it. Once it occurs, you're cooked. Ethylene glycol is what led to the, in, uh, the start of the Food and Drug Administration. 1937, 1938, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the president. They have the invention of sulfa antibiotics and they start giving sulfa antibiotics. Remember, there's no prescriptions in 1938. Prescriptions didn't come around until the 1950s. And so the antibiotics were sold over the counter. There was no such thing as um, um, prescriptions. And they said, oh man, let's have all these kids take sulfa drugs because of their uh, otitis and uh, sinusitis and colds. Okay, that's nice. Nobody knew. I mean, it's brand new stuff, right? Oh, but how's little baby, how's little baby going to take sulfa drugs when sulfa drugs are bitter? They taste bitter. Oh, I know what we can do. Let's mix it up with ethylene glycol. Tastes sweet. Mm, mm, mm. Nice idea, right? No testing required in 1938. No testing. You didn't need to, there was no Food and Drug Administration. No requirement for safety testing. You just made stuff and sold it like cornflakes. Actually, cornflakes are comparatively safer than the medicines at the time because their Food and Drug Administration didn't regulate the food either, right? So dozens of children get killed with renal failure, with ethylene glycol overdose, and that's why we're always going to keep talking about ethylene glycol overdose, even when we don't know why we're talking about it, because it was the signal event that led to the start of the Food and Drug Administration, which is you can't just release medicines for people without testing it, for, at least for safety and efficacy. Mm -hmm. The same way the Center for Disease Control was invented to control malaria.
used to be called the Center for Malaria Control. So, oxalic acid, ethylene glycol, envelope-shaped crystals, metabolic acidosis, metabolic acidosis. Now, when you have hepatorenal syndrome, this is one of the only ones where it's not the kidney itself that gets damaged. It's kidney disease on the basis of liver disease. And it fits in with the pre-renal numbers. It has a decrease in the urine sodium, it has an increase in the urine osmolality, and it has a high BUN and creatinine. And the thing about hepatorenal syndrome is that we don't really have a good way to fix it. So we give, believe it or not, octreotide seems to work, and albumin infusions. And we think this might work. It gives us something to do uh, while we're trying to find ourselves a kidney donor, and a, uh, sorry, a liver donor for hepatorenal syndrome. It's kidney failure on the basis of liver failure. It fits in with the pre-renal numbers of low urine sodium, high urine osmolality, because the kidneys are starved for perfusion. The kidneys are starved for perfusion because the liver failure leads to decreased flow of blood into those blood vessels. Octreotide, which is somatostatin, and albumin try and bump it up. <gasps> oh, 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 we got a 37 year old man and he gets run over by a car. He gets run over by a truck. He gets run over by a truck that's carrying statins. He has a seizure after he's run over by a truck that's having statins, and he's lying in the floor of the highway in the hospital after being run over by a truck carrying statins and having a seizure. And then I punched him in the arm. What's the most urgent step? What's the most important thing to do first? How's he gonna die? Yeah, rhabdomyolysis, but how's he gonna die? So I'm telling you, you can have seizures. Your muscles crunch. Statins, trauma. Did you know that just immobility leads to rhabdomyolysis? If you lay down and you don't move for four hours, your muscles break down. Actually, they break down after how long? How long does it take before your cells start to break down of immobility? Two hours. If you don't move every two hours, you start to necrose. That's why in our REM sleep cycles, we take a, a half an hour, 40 minutes to go down in the REM. We stay down in the REM for 20 minutes or so, half an hour, and we come back up and down. And so every 90 minutes, 120 minutes, every hour and a half to two hours, we're programmed to move while we're asleep. But if you lie on a hard surface, you will wake up and you will have rhabdomyolysis. So the question is three things. How do you die? And what is the first diagnostic test to tell you you have rhabdomyolysis for sure? A lot of people can have an elevated CPK, but it doesn't mean you're getting kidney damage from rhabdomyolysis just because you have a high CPK. The most important test is potassium or EKG. So if it says, what is the most urgent step? Which of these things must you do first? When the question says do, step, action, management, do, step, action, management, does that mean a test or does that mean a treatment? And it can be either one. When it says do, step, action, management, does it mean a test or a treatment? And it could be either one. The most important thing is to see if they've got peak T waves or they've got massive hyperkalemia. Because if you've got massive hyperkalemia and peak T waves, you need to give calcium chloride or calcium gluconate to protect the heart. Now, the test that's first is the urinalysis will be dipstick positive for blood. And then when you go looking for cells, you have no cells seen because the dipstick can't tell the difference, remember? 
between hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells, hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells, hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells, the dipstick cannot tell. Hey! That's how you know. Oh, you might say, well, fishy, fishy. How come, why not just get an increased CPK level? Because a CPK level elevation doesn't really mean automatically that you have renal failure from rhabdomyolysis. People who are muscular and go to the gym can have CPK level. It's elevated. Intramuscular injection elevates the CPK level. But it doesn't mean the same thing as saying, I have renal failure on the basis of rhabdomyolysis. Now, the therapy for rhabdomyolysis is lots of fluids. Sometimes we give bicarbonate, and then we talk about giving mannitol and then never use it. But mannitol basically increases the urine flow, and mannitol decreases the duration of contact with the hemoglobin, the myoglobin. If it is hemoglobinuria, decrease the contact with hemoglobin. If rhabdomyolysis decreases it with myoglobin. The myoglobin cooks your kidneys, fries your kidneys, shawarma your kidney, tandoori your kidney, chicharrones de riñones. And so just like putting your hand on a hot stove, we want to speed up urine flow by giving fluids and mannitol to pull the hand off the hot stove because the myoglobin cooks the kidneys, fries them, kills the cells, muddy brown casts. So the more fluids we give, the more flat mannitol we give, the more quickly we make urine and get flush out the kidneys. Mostly it's fluids. Bicarbonate reverses the metabolic acidosis, because there is one. Bicarbonate helps lower the potassium as well. And here's the other thing is, why do you get a decreased blood calcium? Why do you get a decreased blood calcium for a person with rhabdomyolysis? Why do you get a decreased blood calcium? Decreased blood calcium? Why do you get a decreased blood calcium? You get a decreased blood calcium because damaged muscles bind calcium. Damaged muscles bind calcium. When you have a damaged muscle and the surface of the muscle gets, the cells become damaged, there's something, if you remember from the step one, complex one part of your brain, called the sarcoplasmic reticulum for calcium, sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum, the circa, Sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum for calcium. It's basically where in the muscle cell is the calcium stored. And when you remove the surface or the sides of muscles, because this wall breaks down, the sarcoplasmic reticulum for calcium binds the calcium, pulls it right out of the bloodstream. See, if we stripped off your muscles and put it in a bath with calcium in it, it would suck up all the calcium would suck up all that calcium. And that's why the calcium level goes low. Short answer, you could say, damaged muscle binds calcium. Sucks it up, sucks it up. Fluids, bicarb, mannitol. Oh, you have a person who goes for a catheter procedure. A catheter procedure in the heart. Catheter procedure in the heart. They have a person who goes for a catheter procedure in the heart angiography, angioplasty, and a couple of hours later, not only do you have renal failure, but you also have blue skin and blue toes, complement level drops, and you have increased eosinophils. Now, why you get increased eosinophils with this, I don't know. It's probably an inflammatory problem. You might say, well, why not neutrophils then? But there's an allergic immune problem potential to atheroemboli. Atheroemboli is knocking clots of atheromatous material off of blood vessels and it gets clogged up in your kidneys and in your skin. It's kind of like you're reaching up for something, reaching up on a shelf, 
and you knock off a plate off the shelf and it crashes, and now you step on it. Kidney injury from a catheter procedure, knocking atheroemboli off the blood vessels, up in the aorta, up near the aortic valve, up near the entry to the coronaries, as you're going in, and the atheromatous plaques in your aorta get knocked off, they get clogged up in your kidney, causes renal failure, they get caught up in your toes, and you get blue toes, and you get low complement in the eosinophils, and what can you do about it? Nothing, you can't do anything about it. There's nothing that you can do about it. As we said, you can't reverse toxin-induced organ damage. There's only one question for you for atheroemboli, and that is for you to recognize the diagnosis. They have to give you a catheter procedure, they have to tell you that it went in an artery or into the heart, and they have to tell you this blue toe story, in the con or you won't know what it is. So what's the difference between toxin-induced kidney damage and allergic interstitial kidney damage? What's the difference between toxin-induced direct toxins and allergic? Well, one is the mechanism. Gentamicin takes five days to develop toxicity. Cisplatin takes four or five days. Amphotericin takes four or five days. It has to accumulate. It has to injure it by accumulating it and it happens slowly. Allergic interstitial nephritis can happen immediately. Number two, toxin-induced organ damage is from very different substances. Gentamicin is toxic to the kidney tubule. You're not allergic to it. But allergic interstitial nephritis is the same things that cause Stevens-Johnson and a rash. What are human beings allergic to? Uh, stupidity? Penicillin? 10% of the population is allergic to penicillin. You're allergic to penicillin. 10% of the population is allergic to penicillin. Uh, sulfa drugs. The population is allergic to sulfa drugs. It's allergenic. There's nobody, you ever see beta blocker allergy? Beta blocker allergy? Oh no, beta blocker toxicity, hypotension, bradycardia. But beta blocker allergy? Like rash? No. Calcium channel rash? No. SSRI? Antidepressants? Allergic? Allergic, like rash, eosinophils, hemolysis. No, penicillins cause hemolysis, drug-induced hemolysis. Penicillins can cause a rash. I got a rash, I'm allergic to it. Penicillins can cause urticaria. Sulfa drugs can cause a rash. Sulfa drugs can cause G6PD, hemolysis. Penicillins, sulfa drugs, allopurinol. Allopurinol, a lot of people are allergic to allopurinol. Phenytoin, a lot of people are allergic to phenytoin, phenytoin rash, Stevens-Johnson, Stevens-Johnson, quinolones, lamotrigine. These are all the things that can cause you to have allergic interstitial nephritis, but rather than have you memorize them over and over again, they're also the things that cause Stevens-Johnson. Have you ever heard of Stevens-Johnson from a tricyclic? No, dry mouth, dry mouth, constipation, anticholinergic. But tricyclic rash, tricyclic hemolysis, tricyclic allergic interstitial nephritis. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Penicillin, sulfa drugs, alpurinol, phenytoin, quinidine, quinidine, quinine, rash, renal hemolysis, rash, renal hemolysis. The same way non-steroidals can be directly toxic. Non-steroidals can cause allergic interstitial nephritis. Non-steroidals can cause papillary necrosis. Non-steroidals is one of the few substances that can do multiple mechanisms. Non-steroidals, ibuprofen, naproxen, sulindac, meloxicam, ibuprofen, sulindac, meloxicam, naproxen, who the hell should be using indomethacin? And non steroidals is one of the few things that can be both directly toxic, accumulating over time, and at the same time, it can also cause a rash, 
At the same time, it causes allergic interstitial nephritis, and it gives you eosinophils in my urine, eosinophils in my urine, eosinophils in my blood, can cause a rash too, eosinophils, rash, fever, eosinophils, rash, and fever. What reverses allergic interstitial nephritis? Nothing, we don't have anything. You might say, we'll give steroids because it's an allergy, nice idea, does, we're not sure it really does anything, uh, but I'll tell you, if you got renal failure and you don't know what to do and it's getting worse and worse, we'll give the steroids. Uh, you're going to hear that a bunch in nephrology, so you're just going to have to live with that, by the way. Uh, IgA nephropathy. There's no treatment for IgA nephropathy. Yeah, but what do you do? Well, we give them ACE inhibitors and steroids. But I thought you said nothing reverses it. Yeah, well, you know, we're doing people, doctors, got to do something. Give them ACE inhibitors and steroids and fish oil. Okay. What about Hanox Shonline? Nah, nothing reverses Hanox Shonline. It gets better on its own. Yeah, but if it gets worse, we'll give them ACE inhibitors and steroids. <laughs> post strep come on, nephritis. You know, that is antibiotics don't work. They don't work. What did you do? I gave them antibiotics. I just, I didn't like to let the infection being around. So you're doing all these things that don't work. Yeah, well, you know, people get divorced and they get remarried and try and make their spouses happy who don't like them. So try it again. So allergic interstitial nephritis. What reverses it? Nothing reverses it. Nothing reverses it. Yeah, but the creatinine is another point higher today. Okay, okay, okay. Give them steroids. Non-steroidals is one of the only things that is directly toxic, allergic interstitial nephritis, and papillary necrosis. Non-steroidals have one other way to kill your kidneys too. Directly toxic, that takes time. Accumulation, directly toxic, accumulates. Directly toxic, five days. One dose of gentamicin doesn't cause renal failure. One dose of gentamicin, one dose of gentamicin don't cause renal failure. You're gonna let that person in septic shock not have the gentamicin? Oh, I'm afraid of renal failure. Yeah, but they're gonna die of septic shock. Oh, I'm afraid of renal failure. Yeah, well, kidneys can be dialyzed. Death cannot be dialyzed. Toxins take time. non can cause allergic, papillary necrosis, and the fourth thing it does is membranous glomerulonephritis. Really? You can get nephrotic syndrome from a non I know, awesome, right? I mean, terrible, mostly. You can get nephrotic syndrome? You can get nephrotic syndrome from non Yeah, you can get nephrotic syndrome from non <sighs> Now, next one, last one. You have a person with underlying renal disease. Underlying renal disease. I've got chronic pancreatitis, uh, uh, pyelonephritis. I have a person who's got sickle cell disease. Chronic pyelonephritis. I have chronic and repeated renal injury. I don't have a normal person. I got a person who's got an underlying sick kidney. It's injured, it's upset, it's angry, it's hurt. And now they get non-steroidals, which could promptly decrease your prostaglandins and constrict your afferent arterial. And now all of a sudden you have sudden pain and the urine has dead body parts in it. Now all of a sudden the urine's got the renal papilla sloughed off. It's like cutting off your fingertips in a car door. <laughs> Papillary necrosis. Oh, excuse me, what's that? <laughs> Left kidney. What's that one? <laughs> Urinating at dead body parts. <laughs> Zombie kidneys. Now, there's nothing that treats it. We diagnose it by a CT scan. You see it most accurately on CT scan. Lumpy, bumpy, the renal papilla have been sloughed off. Papillary necrosis does not happen in normal people. Papillary necrosis, you will confuse it with pyelonephritis. Papillary necrosis, faster than pyelonephritis. Papillary necrosis, body parts in urine. Papillary necrosis, see it on a CT. Papillary necrosis happens to only people who have kidney disorders. Pyelonephritis can happen to anybody. You can be getting, you know, second honeymoon cystitis, second date cystitis, and it ascends. Papillary necrosis, sudden onset. Papillary necrosis, pain. Papillary necrosis, body parts in the urine. Papillary necrosis, seen on a CT. So, is there anything different on this board 
in 20 years. Yeah, there's one thing. One thing in the entire last probably, uh, I would probably say since uh, 1975. Rasburicase as a treatment to prevent tumor lysis syndrome is only 10 years old. All right, maybe a little more. But that's 10 years ago. Uh, second, we didn't know that we could try octreotide and albumin infusions for hepatorenal syndrome. Remember hepatorenal syndrome, kidney damage and the base of liver damage. This is a treatment. So we have a little bit on the treatment end. And, but the other things, this is a 15 page section. It's a 15 page section on one board. You can do it. Because ultimately, if they don't work, you're going to go on dialysis. And why you go on dialysis is you don't have to go on dialysis because people have anemia. The anemia you can give erythropoietin to. You don't have to go on dialysis for that. You can reverse the anemia of renal failure with giving erythropoietin. You can't reverse the renal failure that leads you to have a massive hyperkalemia or acidosis because by the time your kidney gets dead enough to have hyperkalemia and acidosis, you're going to die. You don't need to go on dialysis because you got low calcium or bone lesions. You can give calcium and vitamin D. I mean, after all, why do dead kidneys lead to low calcium? Dead kidneys lead to low calcium because vitamin D2 is made in the kidney. The active vitamin D, 125-dihydroxy-D, is made in the kidney. And without it, you get low calcium. And with the low calcium, you get hyperparathyroidism, and the hyperparathyroidism sucks out calcium and phosphate from the bone. But you don't have to go into analysis for that. You can give calcium and vitamin D. But nothing will reverse the encephalopathy that happens from renal failure. Only cleaning up the blood with dialysis will do that. Only you, why can't I just give a diuretic when they have fluid overload? Why do I have to do dialysis? See, I don't have to do dialysis for the phosphate accumulating. I can give phosphate binders. Calcium carbonate phosphate binders. But I can't just give a diuretic to have fluid overload because if the kidneys worked, you wouldn't have the fluid overload. The diuretic's not going to work well because the kidney is dead. The kidney is dead. You can't excrete the water. And the last one is pericarditis. That one will really kill you, and you can't do anything to reverse it without dialysis. You don't have to do dialysis for anemia, give erythropoietin. You don't have to do dialysis for the low calcium, give vitamin D and calcium. You don't have to do dialysis for the high phosphate, you can give phosphate binders. Lanthanum, subelomer, lanthanum, subelomer, calcium carbonate. Lanthanum, subelomer, calcium carbonate. When do you have to do dialysis? These are the answers. Now, what I want you to notice about the toxin-induced renal failures, what I want you to notice about everything on this board here, is that which one of them is diagnosed by a biopsy? Biopsy. Take a look. Q2 blue necrosis, biopsy. Any of them? No. Tubular disorders are not diagnosed by biopsy. Biopsies diagnose glomerular disorders. And you might say, well, you know, but that truly isn't that the most accurate test for allergic interstitial nephritis. You know, uh, I suppose so, but then again, you could say autopsy is the most accurate test for every disease. So tubular things are from various forms of toxins. Tubular things don't need a biopsy. Which of these definitely gets better with steroids? Which of these definitely improves with steroids? And the answer is none of them. For allergic, sometimes we try steroids, but nothing definitely gets better here with steroids. Tubular toxin, no steroids. Tubular toxin, no steroids, no biopsy, no steroids, no biopsy for tubular 
toxin, no steroids, no biopsy. Which of these is treated with cyclophosphamide or azathioprine or mycophenolate immunosuppressive, cyclosporin immunosuppressive, cyclophosphamide immunosuppressive, steroids, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide? None of them. None of them. Because they're not autoimmune diseases. They're not autoimmune diseases. There's not vasculitis. Polyarteritis stenosa, Wegener's, Church stress, which is allergic angiitis, microscopic polyangiitis, every single one of them, steroids and cyclophosphamide. No steroids, no immunosuppressives, no biopsies, no steroids. Which of these gives you nephrotic syndrome? None of them give you nephrotic syndrome because tubules don't filter proteins. Now, yes, you can have a little bit of protein because the, the protein weep, it weep. The tubules get sad and they weep, maybe a little protein. But none of them is nephrotic because nephrotic problems, nephrotic problems happen from glomerular. Steroids are used in glomerular. Immunosuppressives like cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin is in glomerular. Biopsies is in glomerular. Which toxin causes glomerular nephritis? Which toxin causes, which drug glomerular nephritis? None of them. Non-steroidals is not causing glomerular nephritis. It occasionally causes membranous glomerular nephropathy, which is a cause of nephrotic syndrome but none of them is causing red cell casts. None of them is causing nephrotic range proteinuria. The tubular things don't cause nephrotic range proteinuria. The tubular things, toxin, no steroids, no biopsy. To see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in one hour.